the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture is pleased to present this program entitled Chronicling the Movement, the 1965 Voting Rights Campaign in Film and Discussion. Um, I'd like to invite to the podium Reverend E. Baxter Morris, who is a uh, pastor at First Baptist Church, Reverend Morris, to provide us with an invitation. Gracious God, we thank you once again that you've endowed us with another chance to be of service to this world. We thank you for the graciousness of your love, for the strength of your compassion that has brought us that we might have a mind to do that which is right. We thank you for the courage, Lord, to face today's challenges. But we also thank you for our past, Lord, that has given us experiences that will let us know that thou art able to do all things but fail. We thank you for our rising this morning. We thank you for the strength of this day and for the love that you've shown us and the compassion that you continue to give us. Now we ask your blessings upon the university and upon all that we seek to do. And for all those, Lord, who have come to share this moment, Lord, search their lives, know them as your children, grant them your presence, that you might strengthen them in their journey, and that in some way, Lord, you might make their journey worthwhile for this day. And when we've come to the end of life's journey, we pray that we hear your voice saying, Servant, well done. For these blessings we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, implicit in the name of the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture is this commitment to examining the modern civil rights movement. Clearly, the voting rights campaign was a significant cornerstone of that movement. Montgomery is an important place, and Alabama State has an important role, or has played an important role in Montgomery. ASU has been at the crossroads of a number of uh, important civil rights activities, <coughs> and civil rights episodes, the modern, um, the Montgomery bus boycotts, the student sit-in movement, and of course, the Selma Montgomery March. So it is not inconsequential that, particularly in, in, in light of Alabama State and the National Service, partnership with the National Park Service in pursuing the Interpretive Center for the Selma Montgomery National Historic Trail, that Alabama State and that National Center focus on different episodes of the voting rights campaign. This, pro this, this today's program, today's um, presentation is twofold. The objective is twofold. One, we wanted to demonstrate how visuals can be used to chronicle history itself. We wanted to use or show how people have, have had the foresight to capture the historic events as they are unfolding. And then how those same individuals have the, I guess, the, the commitment and the foresight to, to understand that the, the way to provide the widest dissemination for that material, that information, and the way that it could be best used is by identifying an institution and, a, and identifying a, um, a repository that is committed to the, the examination and the celebration of these historic events. And certainly Alabama State and the National Center is, is committed to um, celebrating and, and, and maintaining the materials related to these historic events. We have three presenters to start the first phase of today's program. Two of those presenters represent eyewitness accounts of historic civil rights and voting rights episodes. And they, they captured those episodes on camera. And so, and they preserved those episodes for a half a century and then donated those materials to Alabama State University. One presenter who's going to be coming to us via Skype is a documentarian. He's so an interest, he's developed an interest in um, the, the voting rights campaign, particularly the events that occurred along the trail from Selma to Montgomery and in Montgomery. And so he's going to share with you not only um, some of those, the, the, the concepts he's, he's, he's developing for um, 
to, to examine and explore the modern civil rights movement and the voting rights campaign through visuals, but also some, some 3D cutting edge technology that he is developing to, to make this, um, these episodes more interactive and more um, tangible for our uh, constituents. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The second phase of our pro program, I think, is part of our obligation here at Alabama State University and with the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture, our obligation to inform the public in, in, in periodic ways um, about the progress of the Interpretive Center. As you all may know, that Alabama State University was awarded by the National Park Service the right to build and, and to partner with the National Park Service on the third uh, uh, interpretive center commemorating the National um, Solo to Montgomery Historic Trail. And so I don't know which way you came into campus, but depending on which way you came into campus, you would have passed by some construction. So we are very excited that construction is being um, conducted right now um, towards the completion of this, this facility. And so we look forward to a, a fruitful partnership with the National Park Service. We also have representative from the, the Champions and King architectural firm to give you some, some, an idea or feel for the progress of that construction. So we have a two-phase, a two-part um, program today. I hope you will enjoy it. I want to turn to the first part of our pro program, and that is going to include our panelists. The first, of our, first panelist I'd like to include is, is, is Sonny W. Hereford the Fourth. And actually, we, um, we entered into this arrangement with, with um, Sonny Hereford's father, Sonny W. Hereford the Third. And, um, but but um, Dr. Hereford, who's a, a, a Huntsville dentist, a, a, a retired physician, retired physician. Um, he is ill right now, very ill, and um, we, were, we were sad that he wasn't able to make it. But if instead we have a son, and, and it's, not, it's, it's not inconsequential that his son is taking his place, because part of um, Sonny Dr. Hereford's story in, in the modern civil rights movement is that he was really a, 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 on the cusp and the cutting edge of the civil rights movement in Huntsville, and, and spearheaded um, the integration of the school systems in Huntsville. Well, the, well, his son, who actually was a person in 1963 who, at, who desegregated the school systems in Huntsville, is um, Sonny Hereford the fourth. Actually, in Alabama. In Alabama, <laughs> yes, sir. And so, um, so I, I think he, he, he holds a place in, in, in our history in his own right. Um, but his father was a joy, astute enough to understand that what was happening around him and what he was involved in was historic. And so he captured the events in Huntsville and, and, and on video, on, on film, and, and it's just really, really important footage. He, he partnered with the FCLC and Martin Luther King. Um, he, he, his mother, his wife was arrested for uh, attempting to desegregate a local store, um, so that the whole family was involved in the, in the civil rights movement. But he captured this, this, this information. But he not only captured it in Huntsville, but he traveled to Montgomery and captured um, what was happening here in Montgomery also. And so we're delighted that, um, that the family saw fit to donate that material to Alabama State University. So I would like to introduce to the podium, um, well first, I'm, we're going to play a clip so you can see the materials that his father filmed in 
nonviolent direct action have not only become the accepted method of the civil rights movement, but beyond that, the vast majority of all Americans now support and approve it. What began as a limited expression of protest 10 years ago in Montgomery, Alabama, to integrate a bus line has grown into a national phenomenon. As history has spiraled over a decade, the movement returned to Montgomery and involved in direct action, nuns and priests, rabbis, Protestant ministers and laity of every race, social class and age. Many observers have been surprised and even shocked by these methods. The enemies of the civil rights movement have been quick and vocal to denounce them as undemocratic pressure tactics and even on American interlocutors. Yet the truth is that no one can scorn nonviolent direct action or civil disobedience without canceling out American history. The first nonviolent direct action did not occur in Montgomery. Its roots go back to the American Revolution and the boycott against British tea, culminating at the Boston Tea Party. It was the favorite weapon of the suffragette movement when women had to fight for their right to vote. It was the technique the trade unions employed to organize the mass production industries. Many here tonight can recall the events of the 30s when federal court injunctions crippled and stifled union organizations. Even a white man could not facilitate a breakthrough. When the now historic sit-down strike burst forth in 1937, a new national attitude congealed. Through the Congress of Industrial Organizations, a new major movement was born. Then, too, the nation was warned that the profit system was the target of this new form of struggle. Nearly three decades later, we are able to see that the profit system was not only unimpaired, but became significantly strengthened. If there is some confusion about the origins of nonviolent direct action, that is even more about civil disobedience. The two methods are not synonymous. Civil disobedience, in its true sense, has not been employed by Negroes in their struggle. To utilize civil disobedience in its authentic historical form <coughs> involves defiance of fundamental national law. For example, when Antigone insisted upon her right to follow her individual conscience, and religious conviction to bear her brother, she was defying the king and the unqualified majesty of his law. When the Quakers refused to return runaway slaves, they were defying the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott decision. When Thoreau refused to pay taxes and protest against the Mexican War, he was breaking a fundamental legislative enactment and opposing the declaration of war of the Congress. And certainly we all understand this, and I heartily improve, uh, approve of civil disobedience in a creative sense in many instances. But we must see that the Negro today, when he marches in the streets, is not practicing civil disobedience because he is not challenging the Constitution, the Supreme Court, are the enactments of Congress. Instead, he seeks to uphold them. He may be violating local municipal ordinances or state laws, but it is these laws which constitute basic national law. Negroes, by their direct action, are exposing the contradiction. The civil disobedience, or I should say, uncivil disobedience in the situation resting on unjust foundation is that of the segregationists. Negroes have not... 
So um, you see that um, the Dr. Hereford captured a number of, I think, compelling images. Like there was one shot of young children um, that, that Hereford cap captured. And um, I thought for a moment someone in the audience might say, that was me. <laughs> So it's important for us, particularly as we at Alabama State embrace the voting rights campaign and partnering with the National Park Service to tell the story for us to, to, um, make, to, to collect and maintain these types of resources. And so I really uh, appreciate the, the contributions and the donations of our supporters. And um, Mr. Hereford is going to talk a little bit about his father just giving a background, um, you know, not everybody owned the camera, and not everybody was involved as intricately as he was in the modern civil rights movement, and not everybody decided to travel and capture that movement. And so, Mr. Hereford is going to talk a little bit about um, the background for this um, this this film. Mr. Hereford. Thank you. He set that up very well. I have a, about a 45-minute uh, presentation that I do frequently, and I'm going to trim it down to cover just uh, what he addressed there. Um, and I'm sorry my dad can't be here today. He is uh, ill. He has been battling cancer. Seems to be doing pretty well right now. He is hospitalized, but we uh, literally expect him to go home today uh, from, from the hospital. So uh, yeah, he continues to be a fighter. <clears throat> um, but I want to give you a little bit about his background and, as he said, how he came to have a camera and to capture this footage. Uh, Dad was born in 1931 up in Madison County, Alabama, up in Huntsville. He had to walk to a segregated school. Um, he walked along roads where school buses ran, but only the white children could ride on the school buses. And a lot of times the white kids on the school buses would spit out the window or throw things at the black kids who were walking along that same road. And I think that's sort of where the seeds of all of this uh, started, when he was just a grade schooler. Uh, like I said, he went to a segregated school. The school had uh, no lab, no laboratory, uh, no library, and no gym. And uh, Dad had to mail order his own chemistry set so he could learn something about chemistry because he wanted to be a doctor. He was determined that he was going to do better for himself, and he was certainly determined that his children were going to be in a better situation. Uh, than he was in back at that time. So uh, he made very good grades all the way up through school, and when the time came, he applied to Alabama and Auburn, not because he thought he was going to get in back in the late 40s. He knew he wasn't going to get into Alabama or Auburn, but he wanted to get a catalog because he wanted to know what a pre-med curriculum looked like. So he got a catalog from Alabama and from Auburn. He went to what's now Alabama A&M University. It is now a big rival of the <laughs> But, uh, but uh, I'm not partial. I have friends from Tuskegee and from Fisk and all over the place. You know. I went to Notre Dame myself. But anyway. <laughs> but anyway, so he got those catalogs. He went to Alabama a and uh, at normal college, it may have been called back at that time. And he focused on the classes he knew he was going to need to get into medical school. He did so well in college, he was accepted into medical school after two years. Now, I don't know many people who go to undergrad for two years and get accepted. He got accepted to uh, Meharry Med School up in Nashville. Um, and then he started his medical practice in 1956. Of course, practiced in a hospital that was mostly segregated. Uh, there was one room where black patients were treated. It had to be the operating room, the delivery room, the emergency room. And a lot of times, if a person was ready for surgery, but an emergency case came in, or a lady was about to have a baby, they'd have to take that first patient down off the table so they could take care of the emergency and then get back to the other patient, even though there were adjacent rooms that were empty, that were not being used. But, but that's, that's the way uh, he started his practice. So of course, if you're a doctor, from time to time, you have to take classes to uh, you know, refresh your, your understanding, your up-to-date uh, uh, medical procedures and so on. Well, there was no place in Alabama where a black doctor could go because all of those training sessions, all of those medical conventions were held in the big hotels and uh, a, a black person could not walk in and sit down at, at one of those hotels. So Dad made arrangements to take some medical classes out in Hawaii. Uh, I believe they were sponsored by the University of Southern California. 
And of course, if you're going to Hawaii, you want to take a camera with you, right? So that's why, that's how he came to have a movie camera. He said on one of his shopping trips up to Nashville, he bought a, um, a, a movie camera, a projector, and a screen for about $100 back, back in that time. That was late 50s or early 60s or something like that. But that was what allowed him to capture a lot of the civil rights activity, especially up in northern Alabama. But as we saw some of the things that went on here at the, at the end of the Selma to Montgomery march as well. But up in uh, northern Alabama, he filmed a lot of the meetings, a lot of the civil rights meetings, a lot of the protests, a lot of the marches, a lot of the sit-ins. And he filmed Dr. King's visit to Huntsville in March of 1962. So of course, we, we treasure that uh, footage very much. But uh, he was very active, uh, motivated, very active in the civil rights movement. And consequently, September 9th, 1963, I became the first black child to integrate the public schools in the state of Alabama. It happened in Huntsville, but the first in Alabama. In fact, at the beginning of that footage, you saw them panning a newspaper article. And the article said something like, integration happens in Huntsville while others were turned away in Mobile and a few other cities around Alabama. Other uh, uh, students, uh, black students were turned away. And of course, in 1965, uh, he did attend, uh, being a physician, he wanted to be here for the Selma to Montgomery March because he, he thought anytime you get that many people doing something like that, you're going to get people that just fall ill, people that just, you know, pass out from exhaustion, people that twist an ankle, and so on. And he thought it would be a good idea for a doctor to be here. Of course, he, he brought his camera. And, and documented what he could. But anyway, since I only have a few minutes, uh, I'll just close by saying that on, on July 21st, up in Huntsville, there'll be a ribbon cutting for Sunny Herford Elementary School, which is named after my dad and me. We were very, very proud. himself, and so that is a part of the materials that he donated to 
on the university of Michoud. There's a narration here. This was a day to remember. All of the nation march so that all people might have the right to vote, the right to share equally in the promises of America. The marching follows rights. There goes the helicopter overhead. <coughs> there are the troops passing by. They move on and on, more and more. So, you, you, you get to see um, the march through the eyes of, of, of Dr. Winston. And um, so, what, what I'd like to have happen is to have this story come up. And I think you're going to give a little background about um, your father and um, <laughs> <laughs> your dad. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, we are, we are grateful. As you can see, I, I think these types of um, contributions uh, uh, give us a more detailed, more nuanced uh, understanding and picture and feel for of uh, this episode in, in American history that, that we, we want to celebrate. And so we're able to do that in, in a way, uh, understand what that time period looked like in a way that we, we may not have if these individuals had not um, captured these events. Which was First, I want to thank the National Center for the study of civil rights in African American culture for inviting me and my father here today. I'm here to introduce, like he said, a home movie from Dr. John Winston. It's a part of a rather vast collection of photographs and videos he has taken over the years. He may not be the family historian, my Uncle William is, but he's definitely the head paparazzi. <laughs> he's a graduate of Alabama State University, and he's been the attending physician for the students here forever. Uh, he was one of the first black surgeons here in Montgomery, Alabama. He had to labor hard to get uh, hospital privileges here. The first place that he was given privileges was St. Margaret's, and it was dear to his heart until it closed down. The scene of today's video is a segment of the Selma to Montgomery March on Oak Street here in Montgomery. It was taken moments after the grounds of, after they left the grounds of St. Jude, which is located at the corner of Fairview and Oak Street. St. Jude provided a resting place for the marchers after hours and hours of walking. A sad note to this, after St. Jude provided hospitality to the marchers, many angry white physicians stopped referring their patients to the hospital as a kind of revenge, and St. Jude suffered from the loss of income. My father's medical office is located several blocks behind St. Jude, and as marchers headed to the Capitol in front of his office, he was able to take this historic scene. Actually, my mother, may she rest in peace, took the video because my father was also a physician on call for the marchers in case there were injuries during that day. 
He was happy to report that there, there, there were no serious injuries. While he did the thinking, he was certainly, while she did the filming, he was certainly the producer and director that boss her around. 